up and you served with it all of that information. Yeah. My name is Leo Connor, and uh, I served in World War II in uh, Company B, the 182nd Infantry Narcal Division. I was over in the Philippines and uh, served on the island of Cebu in combat. Uh, we actually landed in Malaya and then were sent down to replace an uh, outfit that, that got pretty well shot down. So it was, it was there until uh, we had the uh, island of Cebu cleaned up. And we were waiting then to, for Paul to go to Japan. And then when the uh, surrender came about, why we left shortly thereafter and went to Japan. I was there until I was sent home. Where in Japan were you? We landed on uh, Yokohama and uh, and we went uh, Uh, yeah, I can't think of that uh, northern town we went to, but anyhow, we was on the mainland of Japan. And yeah. when you were in Japan, were you an occupation force? Or? Well, actually, I guess you'd say we was an occupation force. Uh, we, uh, we really didn't uh, do anything much. Uh, I was there until uh, I had enough points to go home, and, which was only about three months. So I uh, left Japan and started home, got in a typhoon, and that uh, let us roll around a little bit. And in fact, uh, after it was over, the captain of the ship said that they lost more dishes than they'd ever lost in any trip they'd had. And uh, but that ship was uh, designed to list 37 degrees either way, and we was going 35. Oh, <laughs> pushing the outer limit. <laughs> but uh, we got to eat one meal a day, and uh, they'd done away with dishes. They just had trays. And uh, we had to stand up to eat, and you hung on, and everything go this way, and then everything go the other way. But uh, uh, we had to go outside because there was 5,000 of us on this ship coming home, and uh, that 5,000, there was 4,999 men and one woman. Oh, and she was a Red Cross nurse from Columbus. But, uh, they, How long did that typhoon last? Several days? Yeah, I don't know. It was about, I think we was in it about five or six days. But uh, you had to go out on top and come down through another uh, portal to get to eat because there was just too many of us. You couldn't walk around. So you had to hang on there ropes and the water flying over you. <laughs> but we had a lot of fun. <laughs> well, I want to back up to the beginning of your service. Um, when you first started out, you came in in the infantry in the army. Um, did you, when you joined, did you join with any other family members? Or did no. You, okay, and you were, you had a deferment, you said. Yeah. I was uh, enlisted. We went to uh, Fort Hayes for our enlistment. Columbus, and that same afternoon then they loaded us back on a train. We went to Camp Atterbury, Indiana, and that's where we were issued our clothing, things like that. And I went to Camp Fannin, Texas for basic training. And uh, was down there through basic training. And after that was over, came home for a, a week on the delaying route, they called it. And, uh, and went back to, to the West Coast and sailed under the Golden Gate Bridge 
on Washington's birthday. <laughs> and, and then you went straight to the Philippines at that time? Yes, point? that was, uh, well, we was in a convoy and uh, it took us 31 days to go because we were wandering from one place to the other. We made one stop and that was at New Guinea. We weren't off the boat, we was just stopped there for two days. And uh, then we went on and, and landed a lady and was there for, I think it was three days before we went on down to the island of Cebu where we were in combat. I was a machine gunner myself, third caliber machine gun. And so if we have some students that don't understand, can you kind of give us an idea how big a 30 millimeter gun is? Well, it's about uh, 30, 30, 30 millimeters. <laughs> yeah, but what I'm trying to get at, uh, from one end to the other, it's just about three foot long. Three feet. And uh, the, uh, the shells that's used in uh, the 30 millimeters are all about the size of my finger, and uh, they uh, come in an ammo box in a, a ribbon where you just beat into the machine gun. Did you usually set them up on the ground or off your shoulder? Or? Both. Both. But mostly off the ground, just used to try Stability. it. Because uh, there was a bigger water cooler, and that one you had to set that because that was just too heavy, but the uh, air cool with the 30 millimeter that I had, you could uh, fire it without having it on the ground. Now, it was, you said it was air cooled, but even when you, if you had it on your shoulder shooting it, did, was there heat coming off of it? I mean, I would imagine oh, that your it ears... Was hot, but uh, we seldom, in fact, I don't know, but one time that I ever used it other than having it on a tripod and being behind it. And, uh, would that be because you just didn't have time? It's yeah. only in an emergency mm -hmm. that you would do it that way. And uh, that machine gun, that was my safety. And we was lots of times in very mountainous terrain and you'd have to slide down, you could hardly walk. And uh, I got to see them a British store out, but that machine gun stayed up over my head because that was my safety. Because a machine gunner had uh, a machine gun, and then you had a, a 45 pistol, which is what you issued. Now, you said that when you entered, you were already married. Yeah, married, had two children. children. And so, did your wife have to, did that interfere with her living arrangements at all? Or? Did she have to move in with somebody? Or? Well, we, uh, after we were first married, my folks had a large house down here on 4th Street. And uh, the back part of it had uh, never been, uh, uh, had a wall board or anything put on it because the fellow that built it used the back part of that house uh, to keep his egg crates and things like that. He was a huckster and hauled back and forth to Dayton. So we insulated and put the uh, drywall up and all. And we lived there for, oh, I don't know, six months maybe. And then we uh, rented a place. We rented it for three months. And then we bought a place. And my wife stayed there until I went into service, and then she and the girls moved back to where we originally started. And uh, she stayed there with the girls. And uh, so her actual living arrangements, other than the fact that we moved back to where it was, she had her own place and all. And she lived on what little we got from service because. She stayed home to take care of the girls. Okay. 
Now, when you shipped out, you, you didn't know anyone that you went with. They were all strangers to you. Yeah. How about the people that you became good friends with? Were they mostly the people that you just got assigned with? And yeah. In most cases, well, practically every case, that was it. I developed some good friendships while I was in service. And uh, one of the fellas that uh, I was in service with was from down here Caldwell, Ohio. And, uh, well, I don't think we ever missed a, sending a Christmas card and that kind of stuff. And visit back and forth a few times, not a whole lot. Uh, have been able to keep that up. Yeah. And uh, actually, this fellow, name was Jack Barnhart, we were separated after we got overseas for a short period of time. I was in one company and he was in the other. We were in the same general outfit. And uh, one night while we were at things well, running kind of smooth. They would let half of a company go to a movie at night and the other stand guard. Well, I got to go to the movie and I was walking across down there and he usually got there before it began to get dark. And I heard this voice yell out, Leo! And up in the top here sat this Jack Barnhart. <laughs> And uh, so we stayed pretty close all the way through. Now, when you entered uh, Lanty and then you said you went on to the other island and you were in combat, the combat began on the second island, you said. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the circumstances? Well, the, uh, this uh, division that was there, uh, which was the Maracal Division, uh, they had lost nearly 50% of their men through casualties uh, on their last big drive, so we were replacement troops going in. And uh, we uh, left Lady. We were issued what equipment we needed, and we left Lady and landed on Cebu and was in combat the day we landed. And uh, that very first day, uh, we got pinned down with sniper fire, but uh, we kept trying to advance. And uh, the other 30 caliber machine gun man and I we started out across an open field, and uh, he was killed instantly. And I was right behind him, fortunately, I didn't get it, but the sniper bullet went in right under his jaw and came out through the top of his head. Now, you say you were replacement troops. Were you able to stay with your unit, or did they just mix you in with everybody? We pretty well stayed with our units because uh, they had lost so many that they were only sending you know, part of a unit, but you more or less stayed with fellows that you knew. And you said it was mountainous terrain. Yeah. Was that where most of the fighting took place? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You uh, lots of times could hardly see them at all. Uh, just find somebody and you knew they was around close. But uh, one side of that mountain was uh, there was water most any place on the other side. There wasn't any water. We were allowed one half a canteen per day, and that included whether you wanted to drink it or whether you wanted to wash your face. Consequently, you didn't do much washing. And uh, that was for 160 days. None of us shaved because there were just, you know, you couldn't use that water. And uh, we uh, had several pretty close encounters with the Japanese. Are there any things that you would like to, to tell us about, or rather not? Or? 
Well, I remember one night we uh, had the Japanese pinned down, and all of a sudden during the middle of the night, they knew that they were pinned down, and they started committing what they call periphery, and they killed themselves. And they always said there was only one honorable way to commit Harry Carey, and that was to take a knife, go up through your stomach one way and across the other. And uh, we had quite a few dead the next morning there. And there was other times when uh, our machine gun section would give an overhead fire to protect the infantry trying to take a hill. In most cases, we were fortunate. We had very few casualties. There was other times that we weren't quite so lucky. What was your um, overall um, leadership division or whatever? Like you were in the 182nd Infantry, but what was the larger movement that you were part of? Or Well, we were... Uh, all part of MacArthur's. Okay. Uh, in fact, when we got to Japan, uh, we could go down uh, to where his headquarters was and sat right along the river there between where his uh, headquarters was and the Imperial Palace. Mm -hmm. But uh, one time while we were there, we had a kind of a non-com club we got together and we met and we had a Japanese girl speak to us one night and I, I asked her I said what is the Japanese feeling towards the Americans now she said they don't have any feelings she said that uh, if uh, we're told to fight, we fight. If we're told it's over, it's over. I said it. If uh, we were told to start fighting today, we'd start fighting today. I said we don't think for ourselves. Now, of course, it's altogether different now, but that's the way it was. And uh, so uh, she said that now this particular girl. She was Japanese, but she was born to, from an American missionary. And so she could speak English so we could understand her well. And she had actually been to college back in San Francisco at one time. And lots of times when uh, we'd be going through the mountainous area, uh, you run across uh, Japanese, maybe laying in the stream, who's dead on this, say on the one side of the water, every place. And uh, one night, after we'd been in pretty heavy combat, we was ready for our evening meal, which probably a pay ration at that time. But anyhow, we began to get just a little reckless. We'd been out for so long, and uh, a little, uh, too many of us got together, and Japanese B-motor come over, get, got 12, just a thing that just like that. I was one of the fortunate ones I'd go for uh, what I, where I had this machine gun set up, I had supposedly a foxhole, but in shale, you know, dig very deep. But uh, I uh, kind of dove for that, and they cut a twig off right above my head where I dove in there. But, uh, you know, uh, those kind of things happen. And you say you can't uh, dig a foxhole in shale, 
you could hear them steel helmets and digging all night long. And oh, some fellow said that deep maybe one when they got through. Now, how long were you in a combat situation? The longest was 90 days at one time. I think it was actually 91. But you were rotated out. Yeah. And now. For, for someone that doesn't understand what it's like, what's a typical, I know there's no typical day, but what's it like being on combat duty? You wake up. You, you try to have somebody in, in each foxhole when you're in real combat uh, awake at all times. So in other words, you may be asleep for an hour and and then your buddy will wake you up and you'll go to sleep. No. No. Anybody that tells you that uh, they wasn't afraid and uh, you slept good the first night, they're lying to you because that just don't happen. Uh, I actually saw uh, troops coming right at us that night and, and the fellow that I was with, I was moved in with a machine gunner that had been there for a while and he, you know, was an old hand. He said, ah, they're all right, don't worry about it. Well, the next morning that was trees that I saw moving. Oh, <laughs> there, there wasn't any Japanese came, came close that night. But, uh, you know, the first few nights you see a lot of things that aren't there. But, uh, as you say, when we got up in the morning, but the first thing that was done, they had what they called a, a group. Uh, one morning it would be uh, one group of uh, infantrymen, and the next morning it would be another group. They went out on what they called a milk run and circled around the perimeter to be sure there wasn't anybody in the area. And then uh, most of time we didn't know where we was going. The officer said, come on, back up, we're going this way. Uh, you just kept, kept moving and uh, until you actually had uh, cleared an area out, you, uh, you really never stopped moving. You just kept moving from day to day. And uh, then once you got things to where you felt it was pretty safe why you might get a day or two rest before you moved on. And uh, one time we had an occasion where we had a day or two's rest and there was back off the hill there was a place you could go swimming so they'd let a few go down and go swimming. But on the way back one of the fellas caught a bandy hen. He was going to have fried chicken that night. Well, by the time we got back, it was too dark to start a fire or anything like that, so you give away your uh, location. During the middle of the night, we thought all the Japs around was after us. You never heard such carrying on in your life. Woke up the next morning, met that going chicken that hung itself up in a bush. It had been flying around trying to get out of there and come down and finally hung itself. <laughs> <laughs> so you did get to eat the next day? No. <laughs> um, just uh, as an overview of your service and time in the service, uh, what's, what is one thing that you would like to be able to tell the citizens or the community about uh, your military experience? Well, I guess the, the one thing that I've always said that uh, with all that you go through in the military, in actual combat, that is, I'd go through it again tomorrow rather than have it come to where my wife and family is. Because uh, it's just something you never want your family to have to go through. And uh, I think you'll find that all servicemen are proud of being able to uh, keep from having combat here in the United States. 
Is there, is there anything that we've overlooked that you would like to add? Okay, we'll begin, if you'd like, by introducing yourself.